Thank you for attending today's event, Social Equity 2.0, Expanding Horizons, hosted by the Drug Enforcement and Policy Center. Before we begin, we have just a few notes we'd like to share with you. First, to streamline the appearance of the event today, we suggest that you hide non-video participants. To do that, click on the three dots at the top right corner of any participant box that has their video off and click hide non-video participants. Second, we want to draw your attention to the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom window. You may submit questions at any time during the presentation. Third, please note that auto-generated transcription has been enabled for this event. To change how you view the automated transcription or to hide it, click Live Transcript in the menu at the bottom of your Zoom window. Finally, this event is being recorded. The recording will be made available on the event page and social media channels as soon as possible after the event. Follow us at, at OSU Law DEPC to stay up to date on our research, programming, and future events. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the event. Shailene? Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Holly, and thank you, everyone, for joining us for um, expanding our horizons, the second panel in our Social Equity 2.0 series. My name is Shaleen Title. I'm a visiting expert at the Drug Enforcement and Policy Center. Um, we really appreciate you coming to this panel. This is a really special panel to me because I think we often, um, when we're talking about social equity, tend to have panels that are very grounded in um, what's happening in existing policy or small tweaks that are being made, um, just like the first panel um, in this series, uh, which you should check out if you missed it. And then we also have panels that are um, full of ideas. I don't think there's a shortage of ideas um, and they can be really helpful, but they often don't have that necessary firsthand government or academic experience to evaluate those ideas or to put them in a framework of how they would pass, who would enforce them, whose jurisdiction it would be um, by people who have gone through that process. And so um, today I think we have a very special group of speakers who encompass both of those things. And um, I just wanna thank you for being a part of this panel. I think part of the reason that we got so lucky um, is that two of our speakers are actually OSU alumni, Kat Packer and Dan Riffle. So remotely um, welcome home. So as far as structure for the panel, we are going to start with um, about 10 minutes from each speaker. And I've asked each speaker to talk about an idea that they have um, that fits the theme of expanding our horizons and then to introduce themselves as well. Then we'll have some Q&A. Um, we can talk either more about the ideas that have come up or bring up new ideas. Um, and you can ask questions in the Q&A function. Um, and I hope that you will come away having expanded your horizons for what's really possible with social equity and that it sparks new ideas um, for you as well. So the order we're gonna go in is Kat Packer, Amber Marks, Dan Riffle, and Doug Berman. Um, and I wanna say quickly, it'd be great if you can come on the screen um, that uh, you're going to introduce yourselves um, and your bios are on the page, but I just wanted to acknowledge each of you, um, starting with Kat, total visionary. Um, you are so thoughtful in your work and um, the time that we've spent together, I feel like you're almost a sister at this point um, because it can be so rare and difficult to try and bring these ideas to life. Uh, so I'm really happy that you're here. Um, Amber Marks, a lawyer lecturer, Queen Mary University of London, is the leading legal expert on Spain's worker-owned social club model. So she's here to tell us about that um, and take time away from her family. She made an exception for us to come to panels. Well, she's not doing panels, so we're really happy to have her here and reminding us that there's a whole world out there besides the um, United States borders. Dan Riffle, a policy analyst on substance abuse treatment and prevention at the District of Columbia's Department of Behavioral Health, and also someone that I really look up to in terms of marijuana policy, just visionary experience in general, and one of the first people who really saw what was going on with the marijuana industry and spoke up about it. Also someone who has been an advisor to people that we all see, I think, as visionaries. 
And then finally, Professor Doug Berman, Executive Director here at the Drug Enforcement and Policy Center, one of the country's leading scholars on criminal laws and sentencing with an emphasis on drug policy, one of my mentors, and someone who I think really embodies being in a respected position, but not um, being afraid to have an imagination. So thank you all so much for being here, and we'll start with Kat. Good morning to everyone on the West Coast and good afternoon to everyone who's on the uh, East Coast. My name is Kat Packer. I'm the Executive Director of the City of Los Angeles Department of Cannabis Regulation. Uh, I have served in this role since 2017, appointed by Mayor Eric Garcetti. Uh, and in this role have led the City of LA's uh, licensure and regulation of commercial uh, cannabis activity. Prior to uh, stepping into this role as a public servant for the city of Los Angeles. Uh, I worked uh, in cannabis policy reform on a number of uh, campaigns, uh, worked on the uh, Ohio campaign in 2015, the California campaign in 2016, uh, and as previously mentioned, uh, I have the great honor of being uh, a three-time alum from The Ohio State University. Uh, so it's uh, it's a pleasure to, to be back home and in, in great company. Uh, I've also had the pleasure over the course of the last several years of uh, working very closely uh, with several of the, the panelists and uh, just really want to, I guess, before I even start, uh, thank Doug uh, for his leadership and Shailene uh, for, for your leadership in bringing this convening uh, and conversation together about how we can expand our horizons uh, as we seek to advance equity and cannabis policy reform. That's what I see uh, my role as being as a uh, public servant in this space. Uh, I, I believe that uh, all of those in the public sector uh, not only have an opportunity, uh, but a responsibility to advance equity and cannabis policy reform, uh, primarily because decades and decades of data now make plain uh, that what we've seen to date uh, have been historic and present inequities. Uh, and uh, there, there has to be this broad and sincere, sincere acknowledgement uh, of harms experienced primarily uh, by, by black, black and brown individuals uh, in the drug war. And uh, what I'm most uh, proud of today are the coalitions that are being built uh, uh, around the, the country and across the world to really center equity uh, in Canada. States, uh, there is uh, a heavy component of local control uh, within uh, state frameworks for legalization uh, and regulation, meaning that uh, local jurisdictions play uh, a huge role uh, in either deciding whether or not commercial cannabis activity will, will take place uh, or, or thwarting the advancement uh, or allowance of, of cannabis activity. Uh, here in the city of Los Angeles, we started our commercial program back in uh, 2017, 2018, and we're now in our fourth year. Uh, and I have to say very transparently, it, it still feels like uh, we are just getting started uh, with the work that has to be done, even just for uh, the administration of a licensing and regulatory program. Uh, but beyond that, to be able to use different policies and programs to uh, serve communities most impacted. And uh, I've seen thus far how uh, when, when coalitions are, are built uh, and when you bring folks like academics, public health experts, uh, experts from around the world to the table, we can really start to have a conversation uh, about how we move forward uh, and, and do so in a visionary uh, way uh, I, I don't think that it's uh, strange at all for, for folks to be frustrated with the status of, of cannabis policy reform, uh, despite some of the uh, progress that's been made across uh, the country. Uh, I think we 
uh, truly have to see uh, these gains as modest uh, to date uh, and, and work collectively uh, to address them. Uh, that's why I'm, I'm happy to be able to uh, serve uh, on groups like the Cannabis Regulators of Color Coalition and uh, Shalene is the, the vice chair in her leadership, but really trying to bring together coalitions of uh, individuals who are willing to uh, put in the work to, to see the change. Uh, horizons. Uh, what I'd offer is my contribution, and, and this is an active uh, conversation that's happening in the city of Los Angeles, but I see it being modeled uh, across the country, is what we're seeing through the licensure and regulation of commercial cannabis activity, what we're doing specifically when we decriminalize uh, activity and create these licensing and regulatory frameworks is we are modeling what it looks like to uh, essentially remove uh, police power. Uh, and I, I say that in the sense that there are uh, so many different uh, laws uh, that law enforcement and, and uh, police officers are, are traditionally responsible uh, for enforcing. I think that this heavily related to conversations about the inflation of uh, police budgets from year to year uh, in, in, in response to the fact that uh, these agencies, these law enforcement agencies are uh, the ones that are tapped uh, to, to be responsible for enforcing various provisions of the law. What we've seen uh, in, in states and local jurisdictions where cannabis is legalized and regulated is that that activity uh, that Uh, looks like we may have lost Kat. Um, I'm going to give her like just a few seconds in case she comes back. And if not, we can um, move on to Amber and come back to her. Um, I think what she said about law enforcement alternatives is so interesting because it shows that if you um, think about cannabis as something where we can test out a new idea as we're building new structures anyways, um, it's a good way to test something big, right? It's the opposite of sometimes people say, well, cannabis isn't going to solve everything, right? We can't use cannabis to solve policing. We can't use cannabis to solve racism, which is true, but also we can use it to test out something like alternatives to, um, to policing. Okay, so Kat's internet is out. So let's move on to Amber and talk about worker-owned social clubs in Spain. Thank you so much, Amber, take it away. We can't hear you, Amber. Um, there we go. Thank you, maternity leave. I've been off uh, Zoom for some time. So thank you, Shaleen, for inviting me uh, to this panel. It's a, it's a real pleasure for me to take part in such an important conversation and at such uh, a pivotal time. Um, and you've asked me to speak about uh, Spanish, Spanish uh, cannabis clubs. And if I can do this succinctly enough, then perhaps I can uh, take a moment at the um, end to um, say a few words from, a, from an activist or more personal point of view. Um, so I'm always very happy to talk about Spanish um, cannabis clubs because they've actually received very little attention. Um, and I don't think they've received the praise that they uh, deserve. I think the reason for that is because they've evolved over time. So actually the first cannabis association uh, was founded in 1987. And the cannabis club model, as we know it now, uh, the first one was in 2008. And so this model has evolved slowly over time as a result of um, activism, academic work, and a sympathetic and quite advanced, I think, in their thinking judiciary. Um, but it hasn't resulted um, from a newsworthy um, single nationwide political or legislative initiative. And I think that's why it hasn't had the, the attention that it deserves. Um, it's also not much discussed in policy circles. 
And I think the reason for that is that unfortunately it's quite hard to get empirical data from it because it's legal status. Um, and I can go into the complexities of this if it's of interest to anyone, but it's essentially ambiguous at the moment. And so that does make it quite difficult to collect um, data. So I just start with a brief outline of what the model consists of. And I like uh, the way you, you were described it, Shaleen, as a worker owned, and that's absolutely um, the way to think of it. Um, so it's a democratically structured, not-for-profit, um, members only, um, and those members um, must be cannabis, adult cannabis consumers. The board members of the association um, cultivate or otherwise acquire cannabis on behalf of the members. Membership is restricted to persons who are nominated by and known to at least one other member of, um, of the uh, association and they need to be known as someone who is already using cannabis. Uh, when these associations rent premises to provide space for their members to acquire um, or to consume cannabis, then we have what's known as the Spanish Cannabis Club model. And its roots are described as being in harm reduction and rights protection. Um, and as I'll, I'll talk about in a moment, I, I really like that uh, respect for rights um, characteristic of, um, of the model. So in Spain, cannabis associations must comply with the legal regime for associations. And they are essentially legal entities that consist of three or more people with shared interests. So uh, before cannabis associations arrived, um, perhaps a more popular one would have been uh, an association for people with an affinity for uh, fishing. Um, or now it might be a shared interest in all things green, um, might be how it's uh, described in the, in the paperwork. So the associations have to have constitutions that lay out the basis on which they operate um, and what their communal objectives are. So this constitution has to be democratic and it has to provide for the holding of a general assembly at least uh, once a year. Any monies that are generated uh, by the association's activities must be used to further the objectives of the association. And lastly, the association must be inscribed in a public register, and that registration must include a copy of the constitution, um, which includes the names of the board of directors, uh, but I think importantly, not the names um, of the members. A very quick uh, potted history of Spain's cannabis club. Um, it's important to realise that possession for personal use of cannabis or indeed any drug has never been a criminal offence in Spain. And the first association arose as a response to um, the prohibition of cannabis possession in public. Um, so this was what outraged uh, public. So um, was born. Um, then at the same, around the same time, in a separate development, we've got Spain's Supreme Court that developed um, what's known as the Shared Consumption Doctrine. And the court developed this because it saw the, the scope of the offence of supply as being disproportionate, given that its objective was supposedly the protection of public health. And so what the Supreme Court decided um, in the 90s was if, if someone has purchased drugs on behalf of a group, so it's a group of friends essentially that have put in money uh, and one person has, has purchased it, then, then that drug, or sorry, that, that conduct is the same as um, personal possession. Um, so the fact that it's shared amongst a group of friends doesn't make that supply. What then happened is a group of activists used this doctrine to justify their founding of a cannabis association where its registered objective was providing cannabis for its membership body. And for various reasons, which I can go into and which are quite amusing, uh, there was a great deal of publicity uh, around 2008 um, and about um, this, this legal concept. And coinciding as it did with an economic crisis in Spain, this resulted in a boom um, in cannabis clubs across the country. Um, and the, 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 the reason that I think the economic crisis was relevant is because this model essentially enabled um, communities to at least provide a salary to persons um, who were running the club. Um, so um, there were at least jobs um, for those who were involved. 
Now, prosecutions of these clubs were brought, um, but most of the regional courts acquitted um, those that were charged because they said, well, there is no harm to public health here. Um, this is um, a group of people who have got together and, and agreed um, um, to designate or uh, nominate some to acquire the cannabis um, on their behalf. And so what the result uh, has been in Spain, and let's take the region of Catalonia, uh, where Barcelona is as an example, is we now have several hundred such clubs and associations. And, and these range from a humble countryside premises of some 15 friends um, who've known each other uh, forever and get together um, to share a communal crop, um, to the lavishly uh, decorated uh, club premises of people who are clearly brand building for the future um, and they might have um, several thousand members. Um, and a club, uh, one of the lawyers who represents um, these clubs said that what he likes most uh, about this model is that each club is its own universe of regulations. Um, so each has its own often highly um, idiosyncratic mission and constitution. Some of them are very funny to read. Um, and as well as a clearly defined regulatory model in itself, um, the Spanish clubs are therefore a laboratory of regulatory models because there's so many different um, constitutions amongst them. Um, I should add that uh, even though the regional courts uh, and several regional governments um, have declared the activities and status of these clubs to be lawful, uh, fairly recently, the um, central government and the Supreme Court made clear that more often than not, they are actually going to be criminal. Um, so um, strangely, uh, that's one of the interesting things about Spain, despite this ruling, uh, the clubs are all in existence um, and the model survives. Um, and I think the model, uh, regardless of how it's working out in practice um, for political reasons in Spain, um, has got some real advantages. I like it because it is respectful of adults' rights to autonomy. So it puts decisions around the type and quality of cannabis directly into the consumer's hands. Um, it's also respectful of private life in the broader sense uh, that understands that this should include a cannabis consumer's right to socialize, um, so to consume cannabis in a social setting. It also, uh, importantly for social equity purposes, requires minimal investment, um, and any monies earned go right back into um, the association. This might not amount to much. It might be enough to buy a pool table uh, or to rent nice premises, um, but that's a decision for the particular community involved. It also has potential for achieving public health goals, uh, depending on the objectives of the members. Um, so members might want to invest, for example, in testing facilities uh, or in cultivating a wide range of different types of cannabis in order to find their desired psychic state. Um, the production is in their hands. Um, I also really like the legal philosophy around the Spanish model. Um, so there's two key uh, legal planks. One is the right to association. And the other is this doctrine of shared consumption. And I, I really like the judicial reasoning here, which is uh, you know, the, the, the idea that public health is not endangered where the cannabis being supplied is at the request of an adult cannabis consumer um, who's known to the supplier and where the supplier is neither persuading a novice uh, to try cannabis nor profiting um, from their consumption. Um, the final advantage of the model I'd like to mention, um, although this does seem to be of more interest to jurisdictions outside of the US, um, is that it's capable of working in such a way as to be compatible with the international drug conventions. I think the best way to think of the Spanish club model is as a cross between a consumer cooperative, um, like we're familiar with um, in the food market, um, or um, so essentially the, the production and the distribution um, is decided by the members. So it's a cross between that and a private members club um, that have always had their own, their own rules. Um, I think, but my knowledge of uh, the US um, legislation is, is limited, but I understand that, that there is a kind of close equivalent to this um, with the arrangements made for caregivers um, where they're just, um, allowed to, um, um, designated caregivers are allowed to cultivate cannabis on behalf of qualified patients. And I know that there's quite a bit of case law in, in California, at least, on, on what cooperative um, 
cultivation means in this in this context. I watched um, the your last session uh, and really enjoyed it, and it helped me to think about how the Spanish model might be useful for you guys. Um, and I think. It would be useful because you talk and it's, it's a problem wherever um, legislation has been approved for um, regulating um, the market in cannabis is that we have this huge time lag between the passing of the legislation and the establishment of a functioning um, regulatory framework. And as Shaleen pointed out in the last session, for very good reasons, you know, it's good to take uh, one's time over that and to ensure um, social equity um, is achieved within that framework. And so this, I think, uh, this model could be added to your, your list of intermediary measures, perhaps. So you talk about um, gifting, um, not uh, prosecuting people for personal possession. Um, and so you could, could do that here, where you define um, possession, um, personal possession quite broadly, as has been done um, in Spain. Um, so I can uh, quickly uh, remind you, basic legal context is we have um, no criminal offence or no prosecution for cannabis possession or cultivation where for personal use. Personal use is broadly um, defined. Um, and then we've got a democratic structure. We've got not-for-profit. We've got the money's going straight back into the um, co-op or association. Uh, we've got a space for people to um, consume cannabis and socialise. Arguably, the not-for-profit status protects against the risks associated with commercialization, um, such as the strength of the um, product um, being out of consumers' control, uh, regulatory burdens, encouraging use, advertising, etc. Um, and of course, it protects um, the consumer uh, from the risks of uh, black market in terms of um, exposure to the criminal environment. Also facilitates research into um, different regulatory regimes. So I think I've used up my 10 minutes um, there. Um, so just briefly in terms of like a visionary aspect to this model, uh, taking it forward, it would be wonderful if we could include fair trade in our concept of social equity. Um, so perhaps we could have collaborations between cannabis uh, co-ops with farmers in countries where cannabis has been traditionally harvested, like Nepal, Afghanistan, Mexico, Colombia, to mention a few obvious candidates. Um, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll conclude there, as I think my time is up. Thank you, Shalina. Thank you, Shalina. Um, I'm going to turn the mic over to um, I don't think that we have Kat back at this time. Oh, yes, we do. Let's go back to Kat if we can. Um, you had just started, uh, you had just introduced the idea of alternatives to law enforcement. Thank you so much. Um, so part, part of the internet kind of reintroduced this, this uh, concept. I'm not quite sure where we cut off, but regulatory models, I see regulatory models that are uh, being developed in state and local programs as an opportunity uh, to model alternatives to uh, law enforcement and traditional policing. Uh, what we're seeing is the displacement uh, or the potential displacement of uh, uh, police as the uh, primary tool to uh, manage uh, cannabis activity in a community uh, with other types of uh, public sector servants. Uh, and uh, through these regulatory models, it's largely uh, licensing agencies or public health agencies uh, at the local level. Businesses are being treated uh, much like uh, other industries. So you'll see uh, heavy participation from your local fire department or uh, your local department that regulates uh, building and engineering and electrical uh, requirements. And as I've seen, different jurisdictions transition, even just over the course of the uh, last several years, uh, I've often wondered if we're taking this approach to dealing with kind of massive commercial cannabis activity uh, and we're supplanting uh, and, and uh, kind of displacing uh, traditional police models uh, with regulatory models uh, it probably doesn't make sense for us to continue to have law enforcement uh, as the uh, primary responsible party to deal with personal cannabis activity as well. And so I think what we're modeling here uh, is an opportunity to expand this concept beyond 
uh, cannabis uh, and identify other areas uh, that traditionally have been uh, enforced and or managed uh, by law enforcement uh, and find uh, a more appropriate agency uh, to take on that responsibility. I think that we're seeing that here in the city of Los Angeles and uh, across the country in terms of trying to provide support and services to uh, folks who experience uh, mental health issues or individuals who are experiencing uh, homelessness. Uh, In the city of Los Angeles, what we've been able to do over the course of the last several years uh, is that there have been other uh, stakeholders and, and uh, actors who are stepping into this role, our fire department, the Department of Cannabis uh, Regulation, uh, stepping in uh, and, and tackling, uh, right now we're coordinating the city's enforcement strategy. And so I can see over time uh, a situation where we get allocated uh, resources to uh, manage both licensed and unlicensed activity uh, and are able to implement a progressive uh, enforcement model. Uh, the other concept that I want to be able to introduce is really using the cannabis tax revenue uh, that's generated from commercial cannabis activity to fund offices of equity. Uh, there are several different uh, jurisdictions across the country who have established departments of race and equity uh, that are trying to do the work of identifying uh, and eliminating disparities in public service. Uh, and there's often been this conversation as we uh, talk about social equity and questions get asked about what role should cannabis policy reform play or what impact can cannabis policy reform have uh, on the impacts of racism uh, in our community. And I think that if we're intentional about allowing the revenue from commercial cannabis activity uh, to be directed directly into uh, agencies that are specifically tasked with being able to comprehensively identify and um, create strategies to address inequities, uh, then we will have models where there can be an ongoing opportunity for us to use cannabis policy reform and, and uh, cannabis tax revenue uh, to drive policies that are specifically uh, anti-racist. So uh, I guess just generally uh, the, the models that uh, I can envision are one using that uh, tax revenue uh, to promote specifically anti-racist policies, uh, but also uh, modeling uh, alternatives to policing uh, through licensing and regulatory programs. I'll pass it back to you, Shaleen. Thanks so much, Kat. Um, let's uh, move to Dan Riffle. Thanks, Dan. Uh, hi, everybody. Can you hear me, Shaleen? Yes, we can hear you. Sounds great. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, it's good to be back. Uh, I want to thank uh, Professor Berman for inviting me. Uh, I look forward to the day that we can do this in person. Uh, as Professor Berman knows, I still have family in Columbus and look forward to coming back for these panels whenever I can to see them. I was just actually just there over Memorial Day weekend, but I uh, would love to see the uh, 50 plus of you who are there uh, as attendees today. I was scrolling through that list. I saw some heavy hitters in there. I saw Pat Oglesby. Uh, I saw Micah Berman, who's, who's there at the law school doing public health policy. So uh, always a pleasure to talk to a uh, room full of smart people, whether it's in an actual room or a virtual one like this. Um, I, I get 10 minutes here. I don't think that I'll need 10 minutes. So uh, I'm going to try to save some time for a Q&A. I always find it more engaging to answer specific questions that people have than for me to just sit up here and drone on. Uh, but I have been tasked with talking about uh, another potential alternative model uh, for making marijuana legal for commercial sales of marijuana. Uh, and that is through a uh, government-owned or government-run uh, distribution model. I think, uh, you know, a lot of folks, uh, particularly our, our American attendees, which I assume is all but maybe one person on this call, uh, tend to think of things as either legal or illegal. And if they're illegal, they're in a black market. And if they're legal, they are bought and sold in stores. Uh, and that's sort of how legalization has gone so far, I think that's partly just a, you know, like I said, a, a fact that life in the United States is a capitalist society. 
I think it's also because uh, some of us who are in the drug policy movement, and that was me for, for many, many years before I went to the House and now uh, where I'm at now, um, you know, we, we ran campaigns that talked about uh, marijuana as a, uh, a product like other uh, products that are bought and sold in stores. We specifically called the, the initiative in Colorado regulate marijuana like alcohol. And, you know, alcohol is, you know, for the most part bought and sold uh, in stores. I think, you know, people also draw analogies to tobacco as well uh, and other sort of vice substances. Um, but what I want to suggest is that, uh, it, and this was sort of touched upon earlier in, in Amber's comments. Uh, and I think, you know, it, Doug's uh, classes uh, have talked about this. I actually have a slide. I'm not sure if I can share my screen or not, but um, yeah, I don't think so. But uh, there's a RAND report from, I think it's 2000, way back when, like 2014, 15, where they were uh, talking about this with, with Vermont legislators and they sort of graphed it out. And you had over here a couple of options that we see normally, which is, you know, marijuana is illegal and penalties are higher, penalties are low. And then you have a couple options over here where marijuana is illegal and it's generally sort of bought and sold in stores. And then there's, you know, eight or 10 other options in the middle uh, that include uh, government monopoly, which I'm going to talk about, um, government uh, sort of public ownership authorities. Uh, you see this sometimes in states that have development authorities where it's not exactly government run, but there's a, a public entity that, that is licensed by the government to run it. You also have uh, what we just heard about from a previous speaker, the, the sort of Spanish cannabis club model. You can have um, you know, worker-owned cooperatives, like she was talking about. You can have other sort of nonprofits. You can have B Corps. Um, you can have, you know, any sort of range of, of options where marijuana is bought and sold uh, that exists between illegal and, you know, regulated like alcohol. Uh, and I actually came to this, my thinking uh, in support of that model was primarily because of, oh, there we go, we can, oh, she's got the link to it there anyway. Um, I came to it through a revenue collection model. Um, you know, one of the primary reasons, maybe the primary reason why I, why I think marijuana should be legal is that it's just a great deal of revenue that's being left off the table. There's demand for it. There's going to be supply. Why don't we just, you know, have a model where we at least, you know, capture some of the revenue from that. Uh, and you can do, you can do that through taxes. We do do that through taxes. You can have a 10 or a 20 or even a 40 or 60% tax if you want. But if you do that, you're leaving 90 or 80 or 60 or you know more percent of the revenue uh, on the table. Why not just have the government? If you if if your goal is to collect revenue, why not just have the government grow and sell marijuana itself, or at least sell marijuana itself? And then at that point, you're capturing 100 percent of the revenue. Uh, but the other thing I think that, that attracted me to it too is the public health uh, element of this. You know, marijuana is not as dangerous as alcohol. You know, I, I, I think it was very smart of us to run campaigns where we talked about marijuana being less harmful than alcohol. Um, marijuana is certainly not as dangerous as tobacco or, or lots of other, um, you know, drugs that are out there. There's no risk of overdose. I think, you know, the, the, there is some risk of, um, you know, addiction or dependency, depending on how you want to define those terms, but it's relatively low compared to other substances, but it is a drug. Uh, and it is, it does come with some harms, however modest we want to characterize them. And the goal in growing and selling marijuana should not be to grow and sell as much of it as we can and to sell it as efficiently and effectively and fastly and cheaply as we can. Uh, it should be to do so somewhat responsibly. Uh, and I think a public model, a government run model can do that in a way that the private sector with the profit motive cannot. I mean, if you're a business, you know, ask Milton Friedman or uh, you know, William F. Buckley, the goal of the shareholder model is to maximize profits and revenues. And the way that you're going to maximize profits and revenues if you sell marijuana is to sell as much of it as you can. And so you're going to target people who are heavy users. You're going to try to indoctrinate, you know, or, or target young users the way that, uh, you know, tobacco industry did back in the 70s and 80s. Um, and I think, you know, there's the real risk, and we're seeing it in some respects now, there's a real risk that we repeat. A lot of the mistakes that we made with the tobacco model. And I think, frankly, uh, we haven't acknowledged them yet, but some of the mistakes that we're making with the alcohol model as well. Uh, but setting all that aside, this is a, a social equity uh, panel. And so I wanna talk about one of the other benefits of a public run model, which is that social equity thing. You know, I, I don't wanna go on at length about talking about the ways in which we have tried and I think failed so far to do efficient, effective, you know, public equity implementation. 
thus far. Uh, I think, you know, Kat and Shalim with their experience and their positions can do a much better job of that than I am. Maybe they have you know, different views on it. I'll defer to them. But generally, the way that we have tried to do social equity, aside from collecting a little bit of tax revenue and devoting some of that tax revenue, but not all of it, um, you know, to, you know, rebuilding communities and, and distribution to um, communities that were targeted by the war on drugs. The primary way that we tried to do it is through licensure and setting aside a certain number of licenses for minority applicants or, you know, applicants who were maybe have a, uh, you know, a, a, an arrest or other sort of police interaction in their history. Um, I, you know, again, I, I'll, I'll defer to Kat and, and Shalene in terms of the experience with doing that, but, you know, we've seen examples of people putting together applications where they have a minority um, applicant, uh, you know, as part of the ownership team, and that person who's on the team has no real role in running the business. Um, you know, their their ownership stake is 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 there basically just to help add points to the application for the you know likelihood of them getting the license. Um, even if that weren't the case, even if you have you know uh, a, a, a above board application and let's say it goes through and let's say this person gets a license. Generally speaking, that is going to be a person who's already got a great deal of wealth and money and power. The, the way that it works in getting these licenses in these states, I mean, they're just so valuable that it requires, you know, having a team of lawyers, having an army of consultants. We're talking not just dozens, not just hundreds, but thousands of pages of, you know, like when you see people submit their application, you know, it's not like you applying for a job where you send in your resume and a cover letter and references. I mean, people are wheel literally wheeling in pallets of paper um, with all of their documentation, um, you know, showing the, the you know, investment team and, and the amount of money that they have and the, the medical experts that they have on there. So it, it's, it's a very, very expensive process. Uh, generally speaking, if you look at the experience in other states, it's going to require, um, you know, greasing the wheels politically, so to speak. Most of these, a lot of these licenses go to people who have friends in legislatures. We've seen you know, actual corruption stories in a, in a number of places, Florida and, and Maryland. Um, so, you know, if you if you want to do it by licensure set aside, it's going to be hard to target, you know, it's going to be hard to get a license to a real small mom and pop operation. Generally, it's going to be people who are highly educated, come from affluent backgrounds, have a lot of political power already. And so, you know, you're not exactly picking somebody out of a haystack, you, you know, it, it tends to go to somebody who's already got the power. And even if that were working, even if even if the model the licensure set aside were working, you're just giving you know a lottery ticket, a, a winning lottery ticket to one or two or four or five minority applicants. And you know if your view of wealth inequality, if your view of you know Fortune 500 company CEOs and the problems that they pose is that there's too many white men, which is definitely a problem. Um, if, if that's your only view of the of the of the problem. Then maybe that's a good solution to you to have you know four or five more millionaire bazillionaire um, minority uh, applicants. But I think if you really want to do st structural reform, uh, if you really want to do social equity and rebuild entire communities and not just make another millionaire or billionaire, um, I think you have to have more broad-based distribution of the benefits of marijuana legalization. Um, and so I think you can do that through uh, through a government run monopoly. It, the statistics on this are very clear. Minority hiring, minority retention, minority pay, minority promotion, all much higher in the public sector than they are in the private sector. And, you know, in terms of job creation, you could have one license holder who is, you know, a minority applicant. And maybe he hires one or two managers who are, you know, minority employees. Or you can have actual hiring quotas in the, in the public sector, um, and you can have dozens, uh, you know, depending on the number of stores that you have in your state, hundreds of jobs that are going to these communities to, you know, target folks who have arrest records, who have, you know, felonies on their record from, um, you know, marijuana growing or distribution or possession or sales. Um, you can, you know, instead of having one millionaire, you can have a dozen hundred thousand heirs or, you know, depending on, you know, however you want to structure it. But the point is, even if the, the models that we've seen in terms of licensure set-asides, they really haven't worked thus far. 
Uh, I, I haven't read a lot of ringing endorsements of, of them being effective in terms of targeting the benefits of legalization to minority communities and reinvestment in those communities. But even if it were effective, you know, the, the best that we can hope to do is create a half a dozen uh, extra millionaires from those communities and hope and pray that they pass on some of the benefits to their neighbors and, and other folks in their communities. I think there's a better way to go about it. I think that you can, you know, actually direct the benefits um, wholly to those communities rather than to, you know, a small subset of them and do it in a more broad based and effective way. Um, I, I could go on and on uh, a little bit more about this, but I think I'll stop right there uh, and let Professor Berman go and save uh, any, anything else for the Q&A. Thanks again, Shalene. Thanks, Dan, for those really great points. Looking forward to talking more about them in the Q&A. Uh, let's move on to Professor Berman. Hello, everybody. Thank you all for uh, attending and for all the other speakers. I'm incredibly grateful to have a chance to uh, talk on these issues and, and sort of think big. That's what uh, us academics sometimes uh, get paid to do. And, and maybe it's sometimes all we're good at in this setting. Uh, uh, thinking big is is very much um, sort of how I came into uh, the marijuana reform space because I'm a criminal justice guy. I've been working on sentencing issues, a variety of criminal justice reform issues for a very long time. And realistically, I came to look at marijuana reform as having this incredible potential because I had gotten uh, so depressed and discouraged uh, with criminal justice reform on other fronts uh, a decade ago or longer, it was really during uh, the Obama administration when I was uh, quite uh, disconcerted by how little big ticket criminal justice reform was going on, despite lots of talk and lots of bases to believe that the, the politics that had started finally shifting uh, towards um, reform possibilities. And at the same time, this is when we were starting to see from, from very much the, the the, the bottom up, uh, the grassroots efforts, uh, obviously starting uh, with uh, full legalization initiatives in Colorado and Washington, but with sort of continuing talk about the need to do something about the war on drugs generally, but you know the war on marijuana in particular. And yet at the same time, I was quite disconcerted uh, that uh, particularly in Colorado and Washington, I think not surprisingly, uh, particularly white states uh, that social equity uh, any kind of equity was sort of left out of the conversation. The belief was, the fear was, I think, uh, that focusing on the harms of prohibition, the past, and all the racial inequalities uh, would uh, alienate or at least uh, make nervous the, the, the soccer mom voters or the other folks that was thought to be needed to build a coalition toward reform. Uh, but I thought at the time and, and you know, was, was sort of advocating for, for more intentionality here because I sense that there was at least talk about uh, doing better in the criminal justice space on racial equity issues and others. Uh, and I, I, in some sense, wanted to test out uh, whether or not it can work in the marijuana space. If, if cannabis conversations couldn't talk openly about uh, the importance of, of addressing uh, racial inequalities, and especially given the ACLU's work, many other people's incredible work at the disparity in enforcement and all the downstream consequences of that. Um, I, I guess I was you know, thinking this is the place to test. And I think, uh, Shalene, you talked a little bit earlier uh, in response to Kat's comments about sort of policing reform uh, that, that uh, I thought, and I think it's continued to be true, that the cannabis space is the area in which we can find out can this work? And I guess maybe the, the depressing part of it would be if we can't make it work here, we shouldn't be optimistic. We can make it work uh, kind of in other areas with other um, substances, with other forms of reform. But what we've seen and what has sort of encouraged me greatly uh, over the last decade is as the cannabis reform movement has built up steam and momentum, uh, not only has racial equity, social equity, a variety of these uh, concerns been more a part of the discussion, they've largely led the discussion. Uh, they've been fundamental to what a number of sort of political constituencies say has to be part uh, of any reform. And to see that build, to see how that's become centered more, still hasn't been centered enough, uh, certainly isn't uh, a focal point for everybody uh, doing work in this space. And of course, 
the results on the ground almost never match up to the aspirations uh, either for advocates or uh, you know even what the law tries to achieve. But I think what we've seen over the last decade in how more political wind has gone in the sails of those who are speaking about these issues and wanting to center them in the conversation is very encouraging and leads me to say, we got to go harder, we got to go farther. We've got to look toward building infrastructure and have ambition uh, in the work here. I particularly focus on the criminal justice side of things, but I think that's true across the range uh, of issues that uh, cannabis activities uh, raise. I, I have in the chat here, I'll just sort of put it, which was sort of the article uh, that sort of launched for me, the thinking about wanting to leverage the success uh, of reform in the cannabis space into broader institutional structures and broader achievements. In particular, uh, I'm thinking about expungement practices where um, you know it, it struck me as just uh, sort of mind numbing uh, that we would create a commercial industry here so people could make a fortune doing things that people still had a criminal record for and um, you know we're, we're still uh, being shut out of not just the cannabis industry but a whole bunch of other industries uh, because of that criminal history and, and it struck me that it would resonate with voters, it would resonate with politicians that that is just an injustice that that should not persist, uh, that we need to address. And what we learned in this space, which again, I think has not only been valuable in the cannabis space, but has been an education for people across the criminal justice reform spaces, you know what? Having a petition-based expungement system, that's a start, but that still leaves a lot of people out. And there are all these barriers to uh, broader access to record clearing and record relief, we need to approach an automatic system. And you know what, my understanding in California and a few other jurisdictions that have automatic systems, that's not good enough. We need to be even more proactive. We need to uh, kind of move forward beyond even, you know, 2.0 of expungement and understand uh, that there are still people being left behind, people not getting the full benefit uh, of, of uh, these laws and these practices. And that again is what leads me to particularly, and I concluded this first article, you know, focused on building infrastructure. There ought to be an office. I, I heard Kat speak of, you know, creating offices of equity based on uh, the revenue from cannabis reform. I think that's a great idea. I want to build criminal justice infrastructure as well, uh, offices of justice restoration, or I saw in one of the chat comments uh, references to reparations, building, you know, offices of reparations. It's always going to be. And I think we could talk, and I'd love to at the Q&A, uh, kind of give my speculations about, you know, why this is more political saleable in this space. But I think it's partially because cannabis use is far more widespread uh, than anybody even knows or admits to. And I think, you know, whether you want to call it, uh, you know, liberal guilt or some variation on that theme, I think uh, enough people recognize uh, across the political aisle uh, that they've been permitted to, quote unquote, get away with something or in some sense have, have had de facto legalization that has only benefited them. And the more we're raising consciousness about how many other people have been harmed uh, while whether it's you know an individual user, their children, their parents, whomever they know that might be a cannabis user uh, has you know, really been able to avoid uh, any sanction or really any stigma, although of course that stigma does, you know, extend uh, probably to just about everybody and and, and still is there. Uh, and so, you know, against that backdrop, I not only look at the expungement space, but I look at a range of other criminal justice spaces. I look at a range of other public health and public safety spaces, right? Uh, I know Kat and I have talked about this a lot. There are incredible inequities in our healthcare systems. Uh, and I don't know I'm actually sort of frustrated. You know, it's, we can't study everything at our center. And we're certainly trying. You know, that, that there isn't as much intentionality about whether or not medical marijuana programs uh, are delivering healthcare more equitably. My fear is they're probably doing it less equitably because we know that there's not insurance coverage and a variety of other structural barriers, uh, both formal and informal, to people's access to cannabis and medical marijuana systems. But that's still something we ought to be studying, and not studying just to find out is medical cannabis regimes inequitable, but does this give us another window on? Does this give us a deeper understanding of healthcare inequities writ large? Uh, and I'm not one who's gonna say, and uh, I, I tend to be overly optimistic at times, but in this setting, I'll be very uh, pessimistic that any study or report or 
new finding about how inequitable our systems can be will miraculously lead everybody to say, let's work on this and let's extend that to every other area so that we you know, are, are, are uh, sort of anti-racist in every respect. But I do think in an interesting way, I've seen in the expungement space, I think we're seeing it a little bit maybe in other criminal justice spaces as well, that there's kind of a, an ability and a willingness for uh, people across the political spectrum to kind of acknowledge how wrong we've been. And uh, that openness, I think, can and should lead to a greater willingness to work on a set of other issues. But again, only if uh, I think there's both the ambition to do so, so that every uh, bill we're working on, not just in the cannabis space, but in, in uh, ancillary spaces, is constantly thinking about social equity, is constantly working toward the other point I'm making, which is building infrastructure. Because once you have people who are working on these topics on a regular basis, once they're studying uh, inequities in the healthcare system relative to cannabis, they're going to have a new understanding of inequities in the healthcare system on other topics. Once they're working on how do we make sure that people get resentenced for old cannabis offenses or get uh, their conviction expunged, they're going to have a new awareness of how we need to work on those topics across a range of not just war on drug convictions, but other kinds of convictions as well. And so that's where you know, I see just incredible opportunity to build out. Uh, and at the end of the day, and this is where uh, Dan's comments is sort of a variation on this theme, you know, I think the tax resources, the economics here is key. I really feel very strongly that you know, at least half, if not probably a, a huger chunk of whatever tax revenues are being raised needs to be reinvested in these topics and issues. And again, I think, uh, you know, there's a bunch of different ways to build out infrastructure that is going to pay back dividends, uh, maybe not economic dividends directly, but social equity dividends and just good public policy dividends, because all the areas that we're talking about, you know, whether it's just inequalities generally, or, you know, specifics about how they relate to, to drug enforcement and drug policy, those are areas that are so underinvested in anything but law enforcement, right? That's been the core problem. We've overinvested in law enforcement in these spaces. And as a result, we have law enforcement models and we have people who lobby to keep money going to law enforcement models, even when they fail, because they're quick to say, well, if we just had more money, then we'd be able to do better. And of course, there's no corresponding lobby for other infrastructure saying, yeah, maybe things aren't going so great, but we need more money. And so part of it is just to try to create a kind of equity uh, in who's lobbying for the dollars uh, that are coming out of this industry and come from state coffers more generally. But part of it also is just to have people who are personally and professionally committed to doing better in different ways. Uh, and so, you know, against that backdrop, I remain, you know, quite bullish uh, because I think we're seeing this certainly in the criminal justice space. I think we're seeing it in some other spaces as well. But I think advocates uh, need to keep kind of their, their foot on the gas, so to speak. And the last piece I'll, I'll finish with is, and it requires, I think, a lot of people in the cannabis space to work really hard to draw in people from those sort of broader spaces. I've struggled candidly, but I'm still pushing as hard as I can uh, to get as many legal academics who work on criminal justice reform to pay a lot more attention to the cannabis reform space so that they can see the potential that's there. I think the same is true for healthcare um, you know, uh, academics and others. Anybody working here, it's not just pushing our space and pushing the politicians and the advocates to think big. It's getting the people who are already thinking big in other areas to understand that there's a lot of potential here and that there uh, can be real dividends from working together on these issues. So I don't know if I kept within my 10 minutes, it's always hard for me uh, to do so, but I think that's about right. And I certainly am looking forward to, to Q&A and, and hearing, hearing more from others. Thank you. Uh, I think the time is, is great. Of course, we could talk to all of you for hours on these topics, um, but we have we have a good 30 minutes for Q&A and we have some great um, starts that, that the audience members have, have contributed and feel free to keep doing that. Um, my first question is for you, Doug. Um, and I, I, you set me up for it a little bit, which is great when you talked about the political saleability of this idea. Um, what role do you see for academics in social equity? 
I think there's an extraordinary need to both legitimate these subjects. So part one is the more you study something, the more it becomes respectable, right? And respectable for other academics, respectable for journalists, respectable for politicians, respectable for students. And I will say it, it's funny because, you know, I faced even as a tenured, you know, senior law professor, you know, not quite stigma, but just kind of, you know, a little bit of cynicism. Oh, you want to teach about weed because, you know, that'll make you cool with the kids. And I'm like, well, maybe, but <laughs> even if that's, you know, one of the things that's, that's fun to think about, there's so much here that not only, you know, can and should be elevated in terms of a discourse, but that um, is just so hard and interesting and only academics, this is really the other part that, that motivated the starting of the Drug Enforcement and Policy Center, only academics can come at these issues with, I don't want to say an open mind, I hope lots of people are open-minded, but with kind of a, a different kind of agenda than you're necessarily going to have from industry participants, from government regulators, from advocates, right? And so, you know, really what drove me to start the center was kind of a frustration that I'd get an email from an advocacy group on, you know, every side of these issues and every other issue is sort of like this as well. I'm like, okay, I already know what this email is going to say <laughs> because the headline says new cannabis study. Okay. You know, who's it coming from? Is it coming from, you know, Sam, is it coming from MPP? And, and um, I, I know they're all working in good faith, but what academics can do first, they have a certain, you know, I think sometimes justified legitimacy in coming to issues without necessarily a, you know, an, an advocate's agenda. But also the more we work on these topics, the more we create space for a range of different people, a range of different types of advocates, a range of different students and, and, and journalists to kind of recognize this is just an incredibly important and valuable area to, to do work. And there's still so much we need to figure out. Um, and I want to encourage all of the speakers to jump in um, or raise your hand if you're more comfortable raising your hand uh, and, and talk to each other. Um, if anybody else wants to weigh in on this question, that'd be great. I can say when I was um, approaching people who had written papers um, and academics uh, to inform policy decisions that we were making, they would often say that they were surprised, you know, they didn't usually hear from policymakers. Um, but then, you know, we're, we're almost always happy to weigh in. Um, so I think part of it is, is just being proactive too. Um, Kat, did you want to add anything? I would just add, I mean, there's, there's just such a need for information and, and data. Uh, there, there's such an information gap that exists. And as a regulator, there are so many different decisions that get made uh, from a public health perspective, from a public safety perspective, quality of life, equity issues, and uh, without the data, we're making decisions in a, in a vacuum. And so I, I really appreciate, you know, Doug's appreciation for the infrastructure uh, that's necessary. And I know one of your next questions, but it's a tedious process to set up that infrastructure. Uh, and I, I think that that's, that's part of the challenge that uh, folks have in this space is that it can be overwhelming to take an accounting of one, the harm, right? But then once you acknowledge that harm, you, you should feel overwhelmed with responsibility uh, as well. And so how do you navigate uh, moving those conversations forward? I, I think it absolutely requires, you know, academics working uh, hand in hand with policymakers, regulators. It's gonna take a coalition for us to, to figure this out. No one uh, organization uh, sector is, is going to be able to, to tackle this uh, independently. And so I'm proud of the coalitions that I've been able to, to be a part of, uh, but it, it feels as though in one, in one vein, uh, things are moving very rapidly uh, and it's kind of difficult to take stock of the lessons learned and I think that academics can play a, whole, a huge role. You know, I imagine a network of colleges and universities and the ability for folks to just engage in open dialogue like this, capture all of this information, uh, because the concern is that next year, if we don't have the lessons from this year, we're gonna repeat those uh, same mistakes. And so uh, there has to be this, this uh, network 
of and, and coalition uh, of folks who are collecting and, and sharing data and uh, government isn't doing a great job at it. I have one more question of my own and then I'll move on to the audience questions. Um, and we have panelists who are doing this um, with infants that we are incredibly grateful for. So come in and out as you can. Um, so my next question, uh, primarily for, for Kat and Dan, given your government experience, um, is basically why is it so hard for the government to come up with and implement new ideas, um, given that their role is to create public policy? Um, and I wanted to quickly share, I've been reading this book, We the Possibility, Harnessing Public Entrepreneurship to Solve Our Most Urgent Problems. And they had this passage that captured it so well, was so consistent with my experience. If we had a new idea around here, it would die of loneliness, Mayor Menino used to tell us, and not happily. Teams with people in their roles for a long time struggle to come up with new ideas, and we've learned the art of self-protection. We don't want to look intrusive in our organization, so we don't offer ideas. We don't want to look negative, so we don't criticize the status quo. And moreover, even if we were brave enough to share new ideas, we wouldn't be allowed to try it anyway, so why would we even bother to think it up? So can you comment on if that's consistent with your experience too and why is government like that? Uh, you're both on mute, so yes. whoever wants to take it. I was waiting on Kat, Kat, Kat's outweighed me, so I'll go first and she can, she can correct all my mistakes. But, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know that I can say it any better than that passage in the book did. Um, I think it's particularly hard here in the in the states. I think, at least with respect to this thing, uh, or my you know topic of of government directly being involved in, in selling marijuana. I think it's particularly tough in the U.S. because we just have, you know, uh, a much more capitalistic culture and, and and sort of view towards these things than than other places. I mean, Uruguay when they've implemented marijuana sales, Canada or at least many parts of Canada, they actually have pursued this model. Um, and there's some good data coming out of Canada as well. Um, you know, the two states or the two provinces in Canada, not, not every province in Canada has, um, a, you know, government stores, but the two provinces in Canada, I think it's Quebec and, and Prince Edward Island, um, that have the highest market share, meaning they've, they've taken most, you know, the, of the marijuana that's being sold in those provinces. Um, they have, they've taken most of it from, uh, from the black market are two of the provinces that do have a government monopoly. Um, and, you know, government can be much more nimble in this, you know, the, the private sector has to uh, turn a profit, has to satisfy their shareholders, they have to pay back the loans that they took out to, to get this license and get going. The government is doing this as a public service. Um, you know, they can set sales and, and prices very low. Um, you know, the, the government doesn't have to pay a tax, it is the government. So. Um, you know, they, they can undercut the black market much more easily. And that's what we did with alcohol. You know, you know when alcohol prohibition ended, um, alcohol taxes were, were set very, very low, um, very concertedly with the intent of undercutting the black market. And then once the black market went away, it was much easier to raise taxes and not um, have to worry about, you know, competition with the black market because it mostly didn't exist anymore. Um, but, you know, it, it is surprising to me that this doesn't get more traction. I mean, I have seen a bill introduced in New Mexico um, you know, those of us who, who talk about this issue, we talk about this one store in Washington and in, in Bonneville, North, I forget the name of the town, but it's, I think it's like North Bonneville, Washington, where they had a uh, public development uh, association or that, that sort of ran a store. Um, but, you know, even, we, many states run the lottery, if you want to talk about vice, um, several, many states run alcohol sales, if you want to talk about drugs. Uh, I'm in DC, if I want to go, if I go across the river to Virginia, and I want to buy whiskey or any other liquor, I have to go to an ABC store, which is, um, you know, it's not directly government run, but it's, it's licensed, government licensed. Um, and so, you know, it, it has been done and the, and the evidence is pretty strong in those states. I mean, from a public health perspective, uh, DUI rates and fatalities are lower in states that have ABC stores because, you know, it, well, at least the theory is that, you know, it's just less available there. Um, you know, you see fewer sort of last minute purchases in those states, but um, but back to your question, though, Shalene, I, you know, I think, you know, we have two parties in the United States, one of which is 100% committed to private sector, and the other is probably about 80% committed to private sector. 
Um, so it's just, you know, it's, it, it's, I think, a uniquely difficult problem here in the United States that you don't see in other countries. I mean, I, you, know, you know, I talked a lot about the, the government model, but I'm perfectly happy to talk about other alternatives, including the, the nonprofit or the, the cooperative collective model. And we can try it in other states. We, we heard a lot about the Spanish one. Um, but um, yeah, I, it, I wish I had something more constructive to offer, but it seems like a, a fairly intractable problem that I don't see a solution to anytime in the near term. Kat, do you have anything you want to add? I think I would just say I've I've seen I've seen different uh, jurisdictions come to the table and explore uh, cannabis policy reform. And it, it seemed as though there's a, a what's a hesitancy to participate. Folks wanted to to wait and see, and I, I can value wanting to uh, have data and information to drive uh, decision making. But I, I I felt as though there has been this. Uh, a fear of failure in this space, right? Folks don't want to participate because they are uh, afraid of failing. Uh, and when you're doing something for the first time and there may not be models for what success looks like, the challenge is exacerbated. Uh, but I, I, I've always struggled with, uh, you know, just the concept of being afraid to try uh, to, to implement change in the, in the first place. And so uh, I've appreciated you, Shaleen, when you've talked about how helpful criticism uh, can, can be, particularly when it's uh, constructive so that we can move policy uh, conversations reform fo forward. But I think that uh, unfortunately we're in a space where uh, politically uh, we, we, we need leaders who are willing to be courageous enough to be bold uh, in, in the actions and, and visions that they're, they're setting. Uh, and I, I feel as though too many of our leaders are in a space where they're too afraid to even try uh, or put the effort, time, infrastructure, because they recognize, uh, again, this overwhelming accounting of responsibility, the infrastructure, but are, are, are afraid to put the time in on resources because they're afraid to fail. Well, one other point too that I wanted to add just on this specific issue of, of, of marijuana legalization and, and the government uh, monopoly angle is the, the fact that it remains illegal federally, I think uh, does constrain the states in terms of the models that they can look at and the ways that they can go about this. And I don't wanna teach a constitutional class on preemption. I think we have a constitutional lawyer here who can do that, but the long and short of it is, if you are an opponent of marijuana legalization and you wanted to sue and stop uh, a tax and regulate regime from going into place, it would be much easier to do that if the state was directly selling marijuana in violation of federal law than if the state was, you know, licensing other people to do that. Um, you know, I still think there's a pretty good preemption case in the latter, but it's it's a cut and dried, straightforward preemption case in the former. Uh, I've talked to people who write ballot initiatives on this stuff about, you know, the government monopoly model, and they're like, yeah, it's interesting, you know. We're monitoring what other countries are doing, but obviously we can't do that here in the U.S. because it's still illegal federally. So, okay. The next question is about um, the free market. We have multiple great questions about that. Um, I did want to say really quickly though that I want to emphasize what Kat said about um, being afraid to try because I think people really often forget that it can be very helpful to criticize people um, who are trying, but if you criticize them and then you don't also um, positively reinforce the behavior that you do wanna see, then just think about it. There's absolutely no incentive to try. And that's a, that's a very real phenomenon that we see. Um, before we move on to free market, Amber, did you wanna weigh in? No, okay. All right, um, so uh, Sarah Siff, who's part of the, the Drug Enforcement and Policy Center and Ipin Thampi have both asked, um, why can't we look into open access slash free market licensing or why can't we simply tax and regulate without the licensure component? Um, and this is a good question because there is a great argument to be made looking at the data so far that Oklahoma, which has no social equity program whatsoever, um, but in fact has just treated marijuana licensing like any other business, um, lowered the barriers to entry and allowed for a very large diverse um, group of business owners that so far that equity program has worked better than um, than the, the ones that limit licenses. And I'll say in Massachusetts, um, we have different city um, 
models and uh, in places like Boston that have limited real estate and uh, a dense population and, a, and an equity program. Um, if you compare that against places in Western Massachusetts that have all kinds of real estate and it's just lower barriers, it's definitely, you know, even it is one's not better than the other. Maybe the Western is even better. So can you talk about that? And can you talk about um, how that might be applied to future states and, and federal policy? Uh, does anybody want to take that first? Yeah, I love talking about Oklahoma, especially because I, I haven't been there in a long time. You know, I'm disinclined to assume that, you know, the Oklahoma model will kind of work everywhere. And of course, it's a medical model and that itself sort of shapes things. You know, to some degree, Oregon has, has adopted the same kind of open licensing model. And, you know, my understanding is it's been less successful there, although that's itself you know, maybe a first mover issue and other things as well. To me, what I think is so valuable about this question is not only to be open-minded about the possibilities, but again, this gets to what you all were talking about, about sort of trying and, and being prepared to fail. You know, maybe there are other models that can incentivize the marketplace that actually could have even more benefits than, you know, let's give a certain amount of license to it so that certain people just go for that. You know, what if we had, just to throw an idea out there, you know, a reward-based system? Right, so that you have a set of social equity benchmarks and the government doesn't say you, you only get a license if you meet these. You instead say uh, those who have met these you know, over the first year or two years of operation, we will then give you additional funding to do this or that, right? So that way everybody in the marketplace then starts competing to try to get there rather than just have what I think, you know, I sense happens now in the licensing side of things, which is just, oh, you know, I'll either try for one of those licenses or I'll try for the regular license. And if I'll try for the regular license, I won't even try to do any social equity. You know, that's for those other people to work on, right? And so, you know, I don't know if a reward-based model or other, you know, mechanisms to try to sort of build it, it could even be built into the tax structure. I think Sarah mentioned that as well. You know, being more creative against the backdrop of what, you know, I know you're writing on this as, as we speak, Shalene, you know, that the experiences so far have, moved us forward and we're learning along the way, but nobody should say, well, the models we've been trying have so obviously worked, let's just keep replicating them, right? And so, but again, that's the challenge of, you know, is government able to be creative or, you know, can we try new models? I will say, and again, this is what's funny coming from Ohio, especially I'll, I'll, I'll shout out our governor, you know, uh, he had the, I don't know, I, I suspect it wasn't him. It was probably one of his staffers who said, hey, let's have a lottery to get people to take the vaccine. And it would have been very easy for a bunch of people to say, that's crazy and a dumb idea. In fact, a lot of people on Twitter said that's crazy and a dumb idea. But it, my supposition is it's worked pretty darn well, or at the very least, it's gotten him a lot of attention, right? And maybe that's part of what is inevitably part of the currency for certain politicians. But you know that, that we've seen creativity in that space and not here itself is another kind of reminder uh, you know, that, that uh, advocates need to sort of urgently push uh, trying new things out as you were suggesting before and not being afraid to fail. If I could uh, interject, I, I think what's, what's interesting is I, I have these conversations with other jurisdictions that are setting up their regulatory programs and they, they ask essentially how they can create uh, or, or try to advance equity in their licensing programs. And, one of the things I, I like to start with is, is just getting a sense of kind of what their, their market is, because the reality is, is if you don't have access to licensure, you can't have equity in licensure. If you don't have access to licensure, you, you can't have equity uh, in licensure. And so uh, there are, of course, these uh, lim very, very limited uh, regimes where there is very, you know, little to, to no access to licensure. But I think to to Dan's point, it's all relative uh, because everyone's not going to participate uh, in the licensing program. And so I, I think the challenge that we have uh, as regulators is that we're trying to do all of these things to reduce barriers uh, to access. That's the, the intention behind many of these programs. But if you don't have the, the licensing opportunity on the back end, then it doesn't matter if you have a fee waiver or you can provide technical assistance, folks aren't going to be able to translate that into the economic opportunity that comes with licensure. Uh, separate and a, but related uh, to this is that 
we're still very much in our early and nascent days of the evolution of our licensing and regulatory programs and our equity programs in particular. Uh, and we have to, and, and there are gonna be challenging conversations that we're having about the sustainability uh, of licensure, particularly in an equity context, uh, because we know that as markets evolve, there is mass consolidation uh, that occurs. Uh, and I think we're all expecting uh, that when some type of federal reform happens, uh, there are going to continue to be these mass uh, consolidations. And so uh, to, to points that have already been raised, I think if we, while there are all of these models that exist with, with local and state uh, policies interacting, there are a thousand different ways to license and regulate cannabis activity. But if we're not collecting the data to see what outcomes those different models are producing, uh, we're not going to be able to say something like in a free market model with X, Y, and Z variable, we were able to produce this particular uh, result. Um, yeah, that's, that's a great point. Um, I was just going to add that I think, you know, the obvious answer to why we are doing the licensure model is that people see marijuana as a dangerous drug. Um, you know, most of us have grown up in a time where marijuana was illegal and in the same schedule as heroin or cocaine. And, um, you know, for the last 10 or 15 years, we've talked about marijuana the same way that we talk about alcohol or tobacco. Um, and yeah, I mean, you can just open up a restaurant anywhere and you don't need necessarily a license to do that. But if you want to sell alcohol in your restaurant, then you have to get a license to do that. Um, I think it's entirely possible that we get to a point 50 or 100 years from now where people look at marijuana as harmful the way that, say, fast food is, is harmful or, um, you know, not exercising is harmful. And, and so, you know, the, 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 the tier of, of danger associated in our minds with marijuana becomes low enough that we don't necessarily see this as like, we can only have a small handful of people selling this. It can't just be everywhere. Um, but I, I think that's generally a good point. And, you know, I say that as somebody who comes from the, the sort of left end of the spectrum politically. I've worked for Keith Ellison and Ocasio-Cortez. So uh, I'm generally a big government guy, but there's no denying that, you know, the more we try to do as a government to steer this program in one direction and sort of, you know, get our hands on and micromanage it and, and anticipate everything with rules, the more rules there are, um, the harder it becomes, you know, the, the thicker those application packets get, the, the more costly it is to apply for a license. And, you know, to an extent, the, the more people we exclude right from the get go before we even start looking at those applications. So um, I think it's I think it's an entirely fair point and something that, um, you know, states are laboratories of democracy and Oklahoma is doing something that a lot of, not a lot of other states are doing. And, you know, so far, at least it seems to be working. And if it continues to go that way, then I think other states should look at replicating it. I've often likened it to um, building a bridge. If you make a process that has low barriers to entry, people can cross that bridge. But then if you have special benefits for people who have been hurt by the war on drugs on top of that, you're helping people to cross the bridge, but you can't cross it before it is even built. Um, so we have time for one more question. And I think this one is kind of an exercise in uh, being visionary on the fly. It's a great question. I also see that people are putting basically comments in the Q&A, by all means, feel free to do that. Um, so this question is about the Illinois R3 program. So this creates um, grants to take tax revenue and funnel it to disproportionately harmed communities. It's considered a gold standard in the cannabis policy world. But a lot of people in Illinois will say what Lawrence has said, which is that um, it's an elite top-down vision of social justice. And so the question, and this is the visionary exercise, what should be done to ensure genuine participatory community control of who is empowered to pursue so-called reparations for the war on drugs? And if you wanna answer this and also make your closing comment, um, let's go Doug, Kat, Dan, and then Amber, if she can make it. There we go. Uh, you know, I tend to like smaller decision-making bodies, right? And I so, you know, really think, um, you know, uh, looking to push down the decision-making to the community level and to then incorporate as many people into community decision-making. And I think this is, again, where my own vision of, of where cannabis reform, you know, connects to so many other issues. It's important for that community to be able to say, you know, either we don't want 
reparations, if that's one of the things they want to say. And I certainly think there are some rich communities that might be eager to say, you know, we, we shouldn't get some of this tax revenue or we, you know, we, we're going to be altruistic in, in thinking that other communities need it more. But then it also can be, we don't want to use this money to have cannabis businesses here, right? We, we have other needs in this community. We have other visions of how to repair the harm that we've seen done here. And I think that's something that only local communities can decide. And I think that's where for me, it's a structural model of thinking about how this goes and then building out the resources. And, and here's where I'll even return to my own affinity for direct democracy, right? Maybe this needs to be something that gets voted on by the community, right? And some people don't vote. There are structural barriers to that as well. But, you know, think it's important to also recognize that, and this is with all due respect to all the people here, myself included, you know, lots of the voices here, even the most progressive ones, are elites in a kind of way that voting still is, but isn't as much, right? And so part of it is not just building structures for local communities to make these decisions, but thinking about models that get people invested in, this has been a big part of what I think has led to marijuana reform as an initiative approach crossover. Wow, people show up to the polls to vote on this topic. I better not say I hate it, right, and risk losing that voter. And that has its own sort of valuable churning effect to getting community members invested in this, right? And so, uh, you know, thinking again about, can this be a guide to improving democracy at the local level above and beyond whether it provides reparations at the local level? And, and, and that's the kind of big thinking that I think uh, everybody should be working on as we work through these hard issues. Was I supposed to be next? All right. Uh, I, I, I'd use this as an opportunity to articulate how important it is to have representation uh, leading these conversations in cannabis policy reform and to acknowledge the work of uh, black and brown women uh, in this space who have uh, led efforts to uh, advance cannabis policy reform historically uh, and at, at present. Uh, I, I think that in terms of uh, programs and services uh, like uh, community reinvestment models, uh, depending on what the actual infrastructure is for uh, the, the decision-making, uh, there of course need to be uh, members of communities who are most impacted, who have an opportunity to participate in that process. I also recognize that uh, it, it's not uh, unique in, this, in the sense uh, what's going on in Illinois where there are uh, political appointees uh, who are charged uh, with making uh, decisions uh, related to, to services and, and programs. I think part of what's necessary is for uh, there always to be open communication and engagement uh, and, and folks need to make sure that uh, they're accessible and uh, their decisions are accessible. And this kind of gets to just government accountability. Uh, I think that there are mechanisms that can be put in place, for example, uh, notice and comment periods so that when decisions are being made by an appointed advisory body, uh, members of the public have enough time uh, to uh, digest different policies and recommendations that are being made and have an opportunity to make comment uh, on those different decisions. And then you have a, a system in place where uh, the agency or those appointed officials have to directly respond uh, to, comment it, to comments uh, presented uh, by the community. At least that way, uh, from a, when we're talking about voting, uh, the individuals who appointed those individuals can be held accountable. But if there's not the transparency and accountability uh, about the decision-making, uh, you, you wouldn't be able to have that level uh, of, of, uh, of engagement with community. So I would encourage uh, jurisdictions to create models that allow for notice and, and, and comment periods. Uh, I recognize that that means that things may take more time. Uh, and I know that uh, policymakers and regulators are, are often uh, under pressure to get things done by a certain time, but I think that that's the balance uh, that, that has to be made uh, so that folks can participate on the front end. 
Um, you know, I, I talked a little bit earlier about one of the many, many problems of marijuana remaining illegal federally and how it sort of hamstrings the states. But I want to just take a second to say one of the sort of silver linings of marijuana remaining illegal federally at this point is that it's, it's sort of forced us to go very, very slowly, um, which I like. Um, you know, the advocacy organizations, the right ballot initiatives only have so much money. So, you know, they can only run so many at a time and they have to go state by state picking the low hanging fruit. Um, you know, state legislatures have a lot to grapple with. Um, you know, there's not a lot of copying and pasting that can be done so far. Uh, you tend to see bills that, you know, get introduced and then modified, modified, and modified over several legislative sessions. It, you know, takes six, eight, 10, sometimes more uh, years before bills get passed. Um, and the, the good thing about that is, you know, once we do this, once, once you make something legal and once you create an industry and once you hand out licenses, it's very hard to be like, oh, this isn't working great. Roll it back. Let's try something else instead. Um, and, you know, we saw that with, with alcohol. We saw that with tobacco. Um, you know, it took decades and decades of, of advocacy in court cases um, and, and legislation before we were able to say, uh, you know, actually, we probably shouldn't have Joe Camel out there. And actually, we probably shouldn't have, you know, tobacco being sold to kids and, and on every street corner. So, you know, I, I think, you know, it's, it's a good thing that we're moving slowly. And the, the slower we move, the more time that we give for all people, including people in the communities that we're trying to direct some of these benefits to, to be heard. Um, it, you know, obviously, only a certain class of folks can make their way to the state capitol and testify on a bill or, you know, very few people even, not, not nearly enough people even vote, let alone email or write their state, uh, you know, legislators. But um, the more time that we, we think about this, the more time that we give it, the more, you know, experiments that we run in different jurisdictions, the more evidence we have and, and can go off in terms of, you know, what's working and what isn't working. And I think it's, it's a good thing that we're taking our time. And, and you know, to the, to the questioner's point, I think we have to use that time to continue to hear from folks about, uh, you know, from what they need, not rather than what we think they might need. It's an excellent point to close on. Um, thank you all so much for your input and your feedback and your wonderful expertise. And thank you so much for the audience for coming. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Shalene. Great job, everybody.